Good afternoon. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here today. My name is Jeff Poulin, and I'm the Arts Education Program Manager at Americans for the Arts. Um, I am not Patricia Walsh, who has published in the program. Um, I'll be stepping in for her. However, I'm very pleased to be here with you all today because this has been a collaborative project that we've worked on together. Um, a few items. Um, just for uh, everyone's reference, uh, this session is called Arts Education and Public Art Towards Practice. Our learning objectives today um, are to conduct an exploration of three years of conversation and research about the intersection of public art and arts education, that we'd hope to highlight concrete case studies for examples um, at the at the intersection of arts education and public art, and that we'll conclude with some next steps, including access to a network of others who are interested in working more deeply at this intersection. Um, I will uh, kick us off today with just a few short slides about the underpinning frameworks by which we are approaching this work and introduce our first speaker who will then introduce our second speaker who will then introduce our third speaker and then we will sit in these very comfortable chairs for some dialogue amongst each other and with all of you in the audience. Um, so the intersection of public art and arts education, how did we get here? I'm not going to talk about the philosophical frameworks by which we got here, but rather how did we Americans for the Arts get here? It all really began um, with uh, the uh, arts education and public art network advisory councils coming together several years ago to look at the intersection of public art and arts education, realizing very squarely that many folks have uh, the same hat. They work uh, as a public artist or a public art administrator and are charged with community engagement and education, or they're an arts educator that is working with students to put up a piece of public artwork in their school facility. So we thought that we would explore this um, in a number of different ways that began uh, through an informal conversation of our network councils, uh, through interviews with practicing experts in the field, and then some historical research and a white paper that has been produced um, to articulate the intersection of those two fields. So what is here? What is now? What are we doing? Um, this is the last of three sessions at the Americans for the Arts annual convention, which started in 2015, to explore how we Americans for the Arts can support this work and uh, in the field, um, which has several different audiences, whether they be public artists, arts administrators, teaching artists, um, and so forth. Uh, th earlier this year, we launched a foundational paper titled Intertwining, uh, the Intertwining of Public Art and Arts Education by Olivia Goody, who will be presenting here today. Um, and then we hope that we'll be able to provide real-world examples for you to take back to your communities um, and continue the work back home. What's next? Well, we'll be launching a public art and arts education toolkit later this summer based on the work um, of the white paper that has been published. And this will be the topic for a public art showcase on August the 28th on Facebook, which you can find online at facebook.com slash Americans for Arts. Thank you to um, everyone who is joining us um, via webcast um, and in the archive, but for those in the room, uh, just a reminder that Americans for the Arts has a few policies related to accessibility, which is part of our ongoing work to pursue cultural equity. First, we at Americans for the Arts believe that amplification benefits everyone, and that no one should need to request that someone use a microphone in order to be understood effectively. As such, we've instituted a policy that anyone who is saying something that is intended to be heard by everyone in the room must use a microphone. There will be uh, one, there's one right here and we'll be floating around during the time of discussion. In that same vein, I do ask that everyone please refrain from side conversations as they're disrupted to fellow attendees um, from, and keep them from fully hearing session content. With that, thank you again for being here and I will turn it over to our first speaker, Olivia. So I should say that the actual title is Intertwining Practices of, art, of Public Art and Arts Education, just so that in case you're looking for it and you can't find it, uh, you'll, you'll find it if you Google the right title. So my question, you know, when I was doing this, can we turn the lights out so we can see pictures? Yeah, or down? Yeah. Uh, is this question of like, what do you need to know? So this is a mosaic on a, on a school. And when we did this project, I really liked the idea of when you walk in, you, you're confronted with this question, what do you need to know? Um, and I'm thinking about that in terms of you all today. I'm curious, how many people here are public art administrators? Okay, 
uh, artists, probably some overlap, uh, people who prim primarily work in arts education. Okay, um, did I cover everyone? Hmm? Great. So that just kind of helped give us a context for who we're talking to. So first of all, I just want to kind of mention that as I started doing this work, one of the things I was really reflecting about is how public art and art education isn't new. Um, these pictures of the opening of the Erie Canal is a historical painting. Here they are, where you see them actually on site in a school that was built in 1905 in New York City. So this idea that we would have public art as an education, as a part of an education, goes way back in the United States. Um, here is in um, Chicago at Lucy Flowers Career Academy. Uh, you see a, you know, kind of a beautiful mural about the out, uh, outstanding American women. So this idea that it, it makes sense that there would be art in the school because we internalize the places that we inhabit. So if a student is in a school, what does it mean to internalize the meaning of the places they inhabit? And of course, we shudder when we think of the conditions of school, some schools in the United States, in urban but also in rural areas, you know, that what does it mean to have a student believe who they are is the place where they are. I started to be thinking about this, and this is Bloom Township High School in Chicago Heights. It's just south of Chicago. And as a young teacher, when I came to the Chicago area, um, I, th there was two schools in the district. One of them was this, this Bloom Township High School that was built in like 1931. And then another, and, and that has like WPA sculptures outside. There were frescoes on the inside. So there was like this sort of grand facade, and then there was also, you know, this sort of beautiful lawn, and, uh, and then uh, this sort of welcome to students. And this is a high school that was built in 1976, this high school where I taught, actually. And, um, you know, it was just a completely different thing. No public art inside. Actually, I wish I had some pictures of what it looked like inside back in the 70s, but it was like bright orange and white graphic circles on concrete block walls, you know? So, you know, I started to really ask myself this question, what happened? You know, what happened in the United States? You know, in most places in the, in the United States, whether you're talking small towns or big cities, schools had public art, they had kind of beautiful woodwork until basically World War II. And then after World War II, you know, there's, you know, even though it was, they obviously they needed schools, uh, as the population grew, but something happened. This commitment to having a beautiful school, you know, faded from American life. And I think it's something that we need to think about, we need to represent, I mean, just by asking that question in our communities, what happened? You know, why are the schools built like after 1950, you know, like the way they are? Again, because we internalize the places we inhabit and the places, that, so the, the places that we inhabit shape us, and then we shape the places we inhabit. And when we think about some of the issues that are confronting the United States today, and you think about what would it mean for students to go into a school that didn't have that quality of civic pride, that didn't have that quality of we believe beauty is part of everyday life. We believe you can learn through the arts. And so I think that one of the things, I mean, obviously there's so many things we do as we rethink American civic society, but I think one of them is to rethink the places we inhabit. So this paper goes into a number of things. Actually, when Jeff asked me to write this, and then I was like, well, wait a minute, do you want me to write about public art as curriculum, or do you want me to write about public art in schools, or do you want me to write about the curriculum of public art in schools, and Jeff's like, all of those. <laughs> hmm. Thank you, Jeff. So, um, but actually, I think that in a way, it ended up being a very productive exercise, so there's no way which I can kind of go through all of these different things uh, in this short time period, but I'm going to kind of focus on just a few things that are ideas that I think might be useful to you in your work. So one of them is just to think about the idea of public art as community curriculum. And curriculum basically is what forms, ideas, people, places get noticed and thought about, and which are ignored, forgotten, or repressed. And so this idea of us thinking about what we put out into the public space as a curriculum, I think is a very fruitful way to think about what's missing in your community and what might be there. 
And of course, when I was thinking about that, I'm thinking about the Picasso. I actually perversely started to really love what people, you know, plop art as I was writing this paper, because I realized that it introduced modernism to many people in America, you know, and that just was a wonderful thing. It challenged people. Um, and then in Chicago, one of the things we've been interested in is that very same year in 1967, we got our Picasso sculpture, and we also had the Wall of Respect, which of course was a mural heard around the world. So this th thinking about how did that change the civic discourse of our city? So public art schools and art education. So what's the role of public art programs in this? It's interesting, in, in New York, they've had this public art for public schools, Public art was put into schools, and then at some point, oh, it's like 40 years ago, they conceived of it as a collection, as a program, so they continued to commission public art for new schools, which is you know, interesting and unusual. So here's a, a mosaic from the 1950s, the really beautiful Romare Bearden mosaic from the 1970s, uh, a Dennis Adrian piece that is a tri tribute to, the, um, to water fountains, and of course that resonance about water fountains of the civil rights movement and then a Jackie Chang mosaic from, uh, the 19, uh, from the 2000s. So they also do a good job of having curriculum. And I've noticed actually that there's a number of uh, different public art programs around the country that are posting curriculum. I would basically always suggest to people if you want a public art program, check your curriculum with the teacher before you post it online. Um, as an experienced teacher, I look at some of the curriculum that's posted in connection to public art, and I'm like, that would never work, you know? So I think it's a really important idea to, pu to partner. Now, another one that I write about a little bit in this paper is the Washington Arts Commission Art in Public Places, their state art collection in public schools, and then their related lesson plans. But we're really lucky, because Mike Sweeney is here today, and he's gonna talk about that in a little bit. And it's a really exemplary example, I think, of a public art program figuring out how education and schools are part of it. And I would totally recommend people really study that program. Um, so we'll hear more about that. So one thing I would just say in general, you're a public art administrator, what might you do? I think a really great idea is to arrange the meetings between your public art program and schools. And these can be district or city or county or state and explore possibilities for programming. Some of the programming might be about understanding art that's in the collection and outreach, but also about bringing work into the schools through commissioning processes and through supporting residencies, or actually at Washington State is a really interesting reciting program. So, I, and I, I, when I give this talk to teachers, I talk about the fact that sometimes the smaller the city or town, the more possibility it, there is for creating dialogue and collaborations, because people tend to know each other more, you know, the people, the cultural people in the city. And people say, well, what are we gonna do? You're just gonna say, you should be giving me public art. I don't have any money, you know, like how are you gonna do this? But I think a really interesting idea when you're working with diverse people is to play together, to host a design charrette or a psychogeographic exploration, which means going through a space and saying, how do I feel in the space, how I would like to feel, and then do some sketches, do some designs, do some discussion, enjoy the outcomes and document them, and then let it germinate. You know, don't think that something has to happen because you first have a partnership. But you know, in my experience, when people come together for a play charrette, what might we do? Somehow or another, a year later, a few years later, people are saying, remember when we did that? I bet we could do this. So I've really decided that early on in the process, we should be playing and sketching art together, making art ideas together, not being so grounded in a, a kind of a, um, so community arts, pro, pro arts youth programming and residency artist programming. So in Chicago, we haven't had an investment by the city in public art in schools. We have had an exemplary not-for-profit. I will say I, I've been part of this group and uh, my husband John Pounds was the director for many years and the group continues. And one of the things that it did was to very often through a number of you know, fundraising strategies, create opportunities for partnerships in schools. So there's a lot of public art in Chicago public schools that was done not through a, um, uh, you know, like an official city school program, but through a not-for-profit that was dedicated to getting materials into schools and onto schools, and oftentimes then had curriculum with youth 
as they created these pieces. Now, there's many models and many methods that one could use to do this kind of work. And by that I mean the models in terms of whether it's a not-for-profit, whether it's a you know, state arts council sponsored residency. There's many different ways that this can be done. But I think that one of the idea of the methods is to recognize what it is that's happening when you find that artist to bring into a school. It's inviting participants into an artist's practice. Artists' ways of making are conceived of as shared space in which others can contribute through the ways of looking, forms, tools, and processes that the artist has developed. So that's very important. As we flip through some of these pieces here, you'll sort of see some of the ways in which this happens. So uh, the San Juan Square mural by Alex Rubio, who does a lot of really interesting work in ceramics. And so you know, he, there's a number of pieces he's working on with youth. Or here's a piece that was sponsored by Forecast Public Art by Randy Walker. And he has this um, style of creating structures on which then the students, the participants, are adding things to the structure. Another really exemplary place is in National City, California, the um, uh, arts project. And actually, we have James Halliday here today. So he'll be talking to us about their work, uh, exciting outdoor work with youth. Here, the mural arts program. What's interesting here in terms of curriculum, they did a graphic design curriculum with students, and then the, the outcome of it was the artist who was teaching this curriculum designing a topography-based mural. Our Jeff Mather, who does some really excellent work with, with youth, where really the focus is on youth learning different techniques. Brett Cook, who is a spray can artist, but he also works in portraiture. So this was a very complicated project in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, um, at Amherst College. And it's a temporary project that lasted about a year, but it really involved people in interesting ways. The other thing to really think about, I think, is the idea of DIY public art in schools, that there's really an intertwining between teaching artists, certified regular art teachers, community artists. And actually, I was interested when I've been sort of researching some other things that I came across this from 1931 in School Arts Magazine, which was sort of like the magazine of school arts, that they're talking about how to make a mural in your school, you know? So this idea of collaborative art making really kind of originates in the American school system. Here's a really beautiful mosaic, which is a combination of glass and broken crockery from plates that the students brought from home. The students are from all over the world at this uh, very uh, diverse high school. And the, uh, it was done by the teachers with their students. So you can see, I think this is an example of in a city like Chicago that has a really rich community arts practice. Teachers can participate in those and then learn to foster those themselves. So I want to just kind of end with talking about the visual art standards. Usually when you talk about the standards, people get kind of sleepy, you know? But <laughs> I think this is really interesting. So there's new national visual art standards. Many of the states in the United States have already adopted them, adapted and adopted them. They've been very popular with teachers. Teachers are using them even before they're officially adopted. Um, and what I want to focus on is one particular very new thing in the American art standards, and that is the enduring understanding people create and interact with objects, places, and design that define, shape, enhance, and empower their lives. So in kindergarten, students are asked to create art that represents natural and constructed environments. In third grade, individually or collaboratively construct representations, diagrams, or maps of places that are parts of everyday life. In fourth grade, document, describe, and represent regional constructed environments. Fifth grade, identify, describe, and visually document places or objects of personal significance. Sixth grade, design or redesign objects, places, or systems that meet the identified needs of diverse users. And then at beginning high school, collaboratively develop a proposal for an installation, artwork, or space design that transforms the perce perception and experience of a particular place. So you can see that public art has actually been given a real place in the standards. So this is very different than the way the standards were written in the past. But this notion that design and place are important has become um, 
really a mandated part of curriculum. Now, obviously, in the United States, people can kind of do what they want a lot of times. But, but the good thing is, is that it's encouraged. And so there are resources, I think, that are being developed for teach, to support teachers in doing this work. So it's important then to think of youth as collaborators, as researchers, as designers. And I'll just sort of um, close with this one uh, piece from uh, Valmeyer, Illinois. So it was in rural Illinois. It was called How You Called From Home. And it was a collaboration between fourth graders, middle school students, high school students, and adults in the community. So it's a you know, rural community. People couldn't agree on the color of the tractor, so we made a purple tractor. People thought that was so surrealist, you know? Um, I can tell by who's from a rural area who laughed. Um, trackers are supposed to be green, yellow, red, or blue. Um, it's about the floods in the Mississippi River. We actually had a community resource room where all these different um, materials were brought together. And then this idea about sort of documenting the history of the place in the mural. People, here's a woman, actually, she's using a picture of her husband's, uh, a, a portrait of her husband's family's farmhouse into the mural. This the uh, one of the original one-room schoolhouses and all the fourth graders did themselves in the clothes from children from 100 years ago. Um, actually, here, if you look, you can see a church and another building. That's because there's a saying down there, which is all it takes to have a town is a church and a tavern. So this kind of the mural is kind of filled with these sort of cultural references to this place and becomes like this really sort of unifying uh, unifying piece for the community. And it, what an important part of it, something I really like, is that it's intergenerational. And I do think as we work in arts education, it's really important to try to think of these opportunities to create intergenerational projects because they can be very rich and create a kind of bonding that is very, very important. So how to get started? Ask who are your people, but then ask who else is around. What site is calling to you? What site is bugging you? If there is no place there, if there was a place, where should it be? Who needs to be represented, investigated, and shared? Thank you. Hello, let's see. So hi, uh, I'm Mike Sweeney and I am the uh, Public Art Program Manager for the Washington State Arts Commission or Arts WA. Um, and just a quick disclaimer, my background is in um, public art and visual art and I am not an educator. Um, I want to thank Olivia for talking uh, about our program and, and really sort of highlighting some of the things we're just starting to do. And, um, but I'm not going to end it there. Um, I'm going to continue to talk about what we are doing beyond that, beyond those lesson plans. Um, Lisa Jarrett, who is our Arts and Education Program Manager, has been a, a great collaborator with us in really helping us move forward um, some of these processes that we're, we've been going through, and she wishes she could be here um, because she's really bummed to miss this conversation. I'm also really glad to know that this, some of this work has been done over the last three years at AFTA. Uh, I feel like I've maybe been a little too siloed somehow in, in the PAN pre-conference, I guess, or maybe it's been talked about there, but I'm sorry I've missed it, because we've been talking about this in our own program for a number of years, and so it's really great to know that this is happening. And if we can add just a little bit to that. Um, I know um, when Patricia approached me about this, she was talking about the next step is how to do this, so how, how is this being implemented into the field? So that I can talk a little bit about. Uh, so uh, we, we are doing it in schools. We've been doing it since 1974. We're the second oldest statewide public art program in the country, and we have worked with K-12 schools from the beginning. Um, we're, uh, um, uh, we are sort of what would be called, Le uh, Lester Berg at the PAN pre-conference uh, would call us classic public art, meaning we are doing object-based art. We're doing permanent installations. Um, it's really about capital improvement and about building a collection. So our education really just is not a focus um, from the onset. Um, but that said, about two-thirds of our projects are in K-12 schools. If you add higher ed to that, colleges and universities, it's about 80 to 90 percent of our collection. 
Uh, and Lisa's program, the Arts and Education program, really has a strategic pro uh, focus on arts as part of basic education uh, in K-12 schools. So uh, the program looks for strategic partnerships uh, to leverage and foster the good work of other organizations. Uh, additionally, she's run a teaching artist training lab um, to teach artists how to work with arts curriculum, uh, artists. Um, and also she's got uh, the roster of teaching artists, which is a resource for other organizations and, and schools that are looking uh, for that expertise to bring that into the classroom. So we have um, obviously an opportunity. We are bringing work into the school. It is a little bit of a Trojan horse, I guess. So we've been wanting to do this for a long time. Um, we're, you know, the idea of engaging uh, with real physical work um, can both deepen classroom learning as well as increase students' sense of ownership and caring for the artwork that's in their school. So our program really relies heavily on our partners who have the artwork in their schools. The collection is something that we manage and take care of, but we hope for stewardship on their end. And um, hopefully if there's engagement with a work, um, we expect that that's gonna help, I think, build that communication and trust. Um, so we're interested in visual art approaches uh, in, uh, with, well, we bring in teachers, uh, teaching artists into the school is the first initiative I'm gonna be talking about. So I'm sorry, I should have introduced that slide but at the very beginning. So we did start with a couple of pilot projects. Um, and we're really interested in visual art approaches as well as approaches that connect with theater, dance, music, literary arts, and media art. Uh, the first, project that we did in the classroom. Uh, this was a pilot project we did with an artist named Becky Fraze, who was a teaching artist that just coincidentally happened to be on the art selection committee panel. So we empower our, our uh, committees uh, to, to bring local community members as well as people that are connected to those schools uh, and occasionally students. Um, and they did have students in the school. It was it's an arts impact school in Washington State, and so there's arts curriculum already infused, and the fact that Becky was on their committee was just perfect happenstance, and so it really made us feel that this is the right project to start, um, and that is, um, we consider this an anticipatory pro project, meaning that she started during uh, design. So she started to speak with the committee um, and engage students, and then we hired her, and I, I think maybe it was a thousand dollars or so stipend then to spend extra time working within that school. All grades participated, as you can see. Um, so these are just some shots of, of what, what she did uh, at the school. So she was engaging in imaginative object making. So on the left, you can see that was, that was a project that she called Wumpuses. Um, She'd work with color mixing, patterns, and observation. So it was a really great project, and, and there was great engagement for the students uh, involved, and the school loved it and still talk about it. Um, I think it was a little frustrating for us in terms of that anticipatory uh, notion for a, an elementary school. The, the, the make that connection about the artwork that was going to come um, was really hard to do. And so I think that if we're going to continue to do that during design, we'd probably do it at uh, the high school level. Uh, the second um, of these pilot projects we did was in another elementary school in uh, Federal Way and um, Washington. Um, and this was a different situation, so we really spent time a little bit beforehand, and, and Lisa was more actively engaged in this as well, and so we sat down with the school and with the committee and talked about what needs were at the school, if we could bring some learning in, what other things could be addressed. And so they were interested in literary arts, um, as well, and so we um, contracted with Rachel Atkins, who is a, a theater teaching artist and who has a personal um, interest and expertise in playwriting. So she used this artwork by Stuart Nakamura um, as a launching point for an inspiration for the residency, and it's called River Reads, and uh, it's sort of a larger than life sculpture that includes um, not only insects, but giant frogs and things, and so it's a great launching point for imagination for kids. So her three sessions started with observing artwork um, and brainstorming things about the setting. So characters that could inhabit the setting, the um, things that could occur there. Um, and the students were using theater techniques to explore character and plot. So they built English, English language art skills by using a storyboard chart where they wrote sentences 
uh, and they were explaining the beginning, middle, and end of the story. Um, the timing was really ideal for this project, so it started right after the artwork was installed. So the students had a chance to interact and really observe and as they were writing their storyboards. Uh, and the timing also was such that they were ready to then uh, perform um, during the dedication for the piece. So there was really sort of a beginning, middle, end even for their performance. So uh, those are teaching artists in the school, and again, we're really hoping to do more of those. Um, probably two to three a year, ideally we would do more, but of course it's capacity and uh, funding. Um, what we've now done uh, is launch online, we've got our uh, lesson plans, and these, um, these are a way to increase knowledge of public art and also our collection, so we're using our collection as a way to engage the public. Anybody can access these. Um, but it's not necessarily about uh, somebody that's working with our program. So the plans incorporate uh, artworks in our collection, um, and right now, uh, right now you could find these online, actually, and I'm Valerie Peterman, who is a colleague of mine at the Arts Commission, has been working on our portal, which is the online collection of our, uh, online version of our collection, and, um, and really working to find a way to engage educators and make them a little bit more prominent. If you have to search a little right now when you go onto our website, but we're getting there. Um, So I'm, I've just got a few examples of what's on those lesson plans. We have four of them. So uh, two at the elementary level, K2 and 3-5. Um, we've got a middle school, uh, six, grades 6 to 8, and then a high school, grades 9 to 12. Um, these were written by visual artist and master teaching artist Meredith, Meredith Essex. Um, this example that you're looking at now is for uh, kindergarten second graders, and it's using a sculpture, a series of sculptures by Nick Lyle and Gene White Savage uh, in Connell, Washington, and they're 12 to 17 foot high sculptures that are, again, larger than life, prairie flowers. So the idea was to engage students' imagination around playing with scale. So they include uh, basic learning targets and some, some examples now of how the teachers would be working with students on these, um, on these lesson plans. We have Washington State standards in the lower right. Um, Olivia was talking about national standards. We've adopted them in Washington. Um, Lisa informed me of that the other day. Um, we'll be updating these to, to incorporate that as well. And I really like here how um, the last section is really just talking about the artwork itself. How did artwork come to be? Uh, this is a high school um, version of this, um, or section of this. So, um, and this is investigating the making of public art, uh, the, the process itself, and, and really revealing what you know, varied materials, skills, and people that have to come together for these projects. And student, students are actually asked to role play, so they break into groups and they go through the whole process of, of, of working on, on ideas and concepts and, and what works and what doesn't work. Um, this page also includes some process photos, so um, you can see scale renderings, and, and also later on there's some more detailed drawings that include engineering stamps. So these really can be used for career and technical education as well as visual arts, and really talking about real life jobs in the arts. And then the third thing, I think I had it somewhere, yeah, the third thing is our arts learning toolkit. So um, we have just published this, and it's online right now. So we're doing our own toolkit. I'm eager to see what AFT is doing. Um, I'm calling this um, our first final draft, and we're really eager to roll this out. And um, this, was, uh, some, this is something that's going to be used uh, as an active engagement tool during acquisition process. So I say two to three times we'll be bringing teaching artists into the schools. I'm hoping everybody else will be able to use these, um, these toolkits as, as much as possible. Um, these were initially dra uh, drafted during that residency that Becky Fraze did with the Atsuku Ichikawa piece with those suspended um, resin balls. Um, but then Meredith Essex, the one who did the lesson plans before, really took it and, and took it in a, to a whole new direction, and, and it's just really wonderful. Um, Lisa Jarrett, uh, again, our Arts and Education project Program Manager, then worked with Mar Marissa Lobsher, who was one of my colleagues at Artswa, um, and, and fine-tuned it. So we're ready to start rolling this out now. 
So it contains a lot of ideas in, in, in the same four grade, band, uh, grade bands that we talked about in the lesson plans. Um, and they're within each one of them, there are different ways to approach engaging in art, as well as non-arts subjects, I should say. Um, so this is really just letting educators know how this toolkit is going to be used. This is one of the earlier pages in the book. And this is one of the lesson plans. This is kindergarten second grade. Um, words, sounds, gestures, just different ways to approach engaging with an artwork that are not necessarily um, standard uh, observation, but also engagement as well. Um, and this is one of the middle school uh, lesson plans that um, that includes media art. So this is a, if you've got a digital, if you've got a, a, a smartphone, you can uh, shoot and then edit videos. And of course, not everyone's going to be able to have access to those resources. So there are other lesson plans that don't cost any money at all. So one is, uh, in, including the middle school, uh, one is writing poetry. So how to um, respond with with words. And then at the higher ed or the high school level, um, it just gets a little bit more nuanced, and and the concepts are a little broader. So what we're hoping to do is contract with a few schools, and I think I mentioned the incentivizing thing at the beginning um, in my slide. Um, probably come up with about $500 initially on to see um, if some schools are willing to take this and test run it for us and, and maybe defray some cost of materials if they have to and just see how that goes. Um, of course, that's a matter of resources, which none of us have too many of, but, um, but we're getting there. I think this is a really good moment, and I just feel even this conversation to me is really inspiring about where we're, we're moving, um, and collaboratively as well. I think that's one of the issues with our program is that we feel and have felt um, fairly siloed within our agency, and um, Lisa is a terrific colleague, and, and she sees an opportunity, so she's gonna take advantage of it. So we're gonna be continuing um, these uh, pilot, well, we can't call them pilot project anymore. We're going to roll them out for reals now. Um, update some lesson plans and, and test run this toolkit a little bit more. Um, it's been a really long uh, planned process for us and long discussed, and I think things are really starting to click, so it's, it's encouraging for us. Um, those lesson plans uh, and the toolkit are online, so um, if, if you're having a hard time finding them, shoot me an email and I'll direct you to them. But the Arts and Education section has a resources um, page that, that has the lesson plans for sure, and probably soon we'll have the toolkit, and we'll have them available through the, the public art portal as well as on the resources pages of the public art program. And I'm really excited to see what is coming up next, so thank you. Um, and James Halliday is next, so come on up. Yes, I want to resume. <laughs> that was, uh, I think, still showing by their own window. What else is open? Sweet, we're here. Thanks for your patience. Well, it's late in the afternoon, so I know energy might be flagging, and I will try and keep this upbeat. 
If you all want to stand up and take a breath, do a shakeout, I would encourage you to. In fact, I'm not even asking. Everyone, please stand. We'll do like a five. You want to do a five, four, three, two, one? Right hand, left hand, right foot, left foot. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. 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 Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. 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 Two, one, two, one. Two, one, two, one. One, one, one. Any questions? All right. So uh, my name is James Halliday. I'm the executive director of A Reason to Survive Arts in National City, California. And I'm going to go quickly through my presentation um, for the most part until the very end when I want to just zoom in on um, the public art and especially the civic collaboration we're doing with the city and some partners. But I want to say at the outset that um, even just the preparation for this um, panel and getting to know the work um, of uh, Mike and Olivia has been really valuable. And I think to echo what both speakers said about kind of getting out of our own silos, when you're in a city or an organization, a school, they can feel like that silo. And so I hope that you're finding your people, your community of practice here today. Um, and I'm doing that in small ways. I came a couple days ago um, to join the Creative Youth Development pre-conference. So I'm already um, pretty high on, on content and connections already. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the main event, which is we're obviously in the midst of. I've left uh, some material about our organization on some of the tables. So those are those random folders with uh, a reason to survive on it. I had just a couple. Um, so share, leave it behind, pass it along. And so the, there are a couple themes that I think Olivia raises in her um, paper that will be um, will resonate with what you see in the presentation and one is this idea of community curriculum um, and for us that's really looking at not only uh, the art itself and and, and the methodology and, and and teaching behind it but really looking at city as both canvas and campus um, and for national city a medium-sized city of about 62,000 people it's a really serviceable size um, to do that because you're really arms, kind of arms reach from anyone you'd want to collaborate with. Um, and that means both friends and or enemies. And then this idea also of elaborating, uh, to elaborate on the coming together of community and to really kind of blow up or expand the idea of a design charrette and its value. So um, look for both those themes in, in the presentation. So um, this here, this is our mission statement and, and a really illustrative photo. Um, Arts has historically been, we've been around 17 years, and its, and its origins were really about healing and creating a safe space, a healing space for young people um, experiencing trauma and various issues to come together um, to engage in art and um, improve themselves. And where we've gone over, over the last 17 years, and particularly in the last six years since uh, setting, up, setting up shop in National City, is to an organization that really wants to help all youth and young adults realize their full potential through the transformative power of arts and creativity. Um, and really looking at those outcomes, not only internal, um, but in, in the community sense as well. So when I talk about what we do, this integration of two things, I call it the bread and butter and the heart and the soul. Um, and the arts education is one and the, and the student services are the next. And so, here it's a very PowerPointy slide, but it's informative at least, um, and shows kind of the components of both of those from the after school, the after school classes that we're, we're, we're known for and still do. Um, but really what we're maybe have been less known for but doing more of now are the, the, the career opportunities like paid internships and community projects and teaching assistantships for young people um, as they stay in our programs. And then with the integration of student services through um, our own department and, 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 and clinicians we work with, uh, the leadership training, mental and behavioral health services, family, the intergener inter intergenerational resources that was mentioned, and then college and career readiness. And then, you know, that engagement of, of, of both staff and teaching artists, uh, building relationships, strong um, adult youth partnerships um, is really at the core of the, the community environment we create in, at the Arts Center. So there's just some basic over, over, some metrics of what the organization's achieved in terms of uh, reaching students. And 
so there's two dates. The 2001 is our founding date, and 2000, 2012 is the is the date we came to National City. So we've been able to um, really go broad in terms of our reach, um, both in, uh, through workshops and the lives of young people we're connecting with. Mm. Um, so these are just, I wanted to give you a few snapshots of, of our space. It's a 20,000 foot square space and it's in the former uh, public library in National City and we've transformed it to have a music space. Your, this is our maker workshop that's about 7,000 square feet. Um, and so we have all these amazing components, visual arts, digital media arts, maker and music that we are able to offer um, in terms of facilities. Now what I want to focus on, again, for the purposes of today is is the work we're doing around community arts. And this is, uh, we've, we've been doing projects that we've called creating vibrant neighborhood initiatives in the past. And we're, we've made that even more concrete and I hope more simple in terms of the name and calling our new, this new department of our organization Community Arts. And um, that's a picture of young people just a few years ago um, working on a mural at an abandoned building uh, about two blocks from our art center. So, this is probably familiar territory for some, but I just wanted to include this, to talk about some of the, uh, we use creative placemaking as both an in-house term, and, and, but these are really some of the elements that we see in um, why, we, why we use creative placemaking in, in, in our approach, which is to include residents in, that, in, in creating public spaces. And really the second around this idea of shared ownership and responsibility uh, of residents, young, young and old, uh, all folks in the community. And, and again, that, that only deepens and ensures that the identity and diversity in the community is represented and celebrated. Through the community arts projects, these are some kind of next level uh, results that we've been able to achieve in terms of youth employment, teaching artists employment, and community participants in some of the design charrettes. And so I wanna talk about our community design model uh, this idea of sort of expanding the notion of a des design charrette. Um, it's something called the pomegranate method. And if anyone is familiar with the pomegranate center in Seattle, is that familiar to anybody by a show of hands? Oh, great. Okay, cool. Um, Milenko Matanovic is the founder um, of the pomegranate center, and he's been a friend of ours for, for some years now. This training is a powerful, powerful tool um, that, that our staff members and, and teaching artists have been able to um, take and then share with young people at our center and then by extension the community um, of National City. And so this spiral process, and I'd be happy to elaborate on this offline and share any materials with you, but it really goes from someone has an idea, someone's have an idea about, I think uh, Olivia mentioned this in her presentation, there's a space that resonates. There's a sp there's some that's either in a good way or a bad way where something should be done. And so that, that germ of the idea is, is the spark. And so working through these stages, there's what's called an initiators group and then a convening group and then community meetings, workshops, building up to th something called early, an early success event, a community build, and then the learning or leaning and celebration. Leaning is just a... That's like when you're really relaxed after you've learned, you just lean back. That's part of the celebration. Learning and celebration is an important part of the whole process. But um, so, and this is an iterative, iterative process and it, takes, and, it, and it takes time. So this, in our case, it, it, it is often um, months of bringing together young people, again, community stakeholders to engage in this method. But it's, um, it's something that we're gonna be elaborating on and, and next year kicking off our first uh, dedicated youth cohort who are trained in this method. They can actually initiate projects themselves rather than what has happened in the past, which has been, quite, quite frankly, a reliance on the adults to, to, to kickstart the process. So I'm just gonna flash through. These are uh, gathering places, public installations, murals that have um, emerged uh, from the pomegranate method in National City. And the, um, the transcription has, is covering the names, but um, I can share this presentation with you. Again, this is actually the back lot of the art center. Um, it's a event space and and classroom space, art space. It's got this great fence that is, very, you know, it's expandable, movable. It's on pallet jacks, and then these funky sculptures that are all over, and then a um, 
than a, a mosaic and, and paint mural uh, on the building itself. It's just really wonderful. We're also on a park that's shared by the Boys and Girls Club, the city, uh, city Hall, and the new library. So we've got this, little, this ecosystem of our own that uh, is serving youth, and we're trying to figure out how to connect those dots as well. I'm going to come back to Paradise Creek at the end, so hold that thought. Um, but this is the initial mural we did on an affordable housing unit that's um, just gone up in National City. Upcycled furniture that we've done that's been in City Hall, it's been in the chamber, it's been in the chamber, it's been left in public places just for public usage. So this is interesting, and this is um, kind of piggybacking on what uh, on what Mike was talking about in terms of working in schools. Um, so the, the bike racks project came to us. The, uh, the city got a grant for um, related to transit and healthy communities. And so the city then, as we're in a public building in, in the old library, they're our landlord, they reached out to us and said, hey, what do you think about the idea of designing and building bike racks? And what would that look like? And we said, that's a great idea. There's a welding academy as part of a career pathway at a high school that's about six blocks down the road. What if we just reach out to the Welding Academy instructor and engage those students and then include them in the design process so that they can they could conceive, build, and then install these bike racks? And that's what we did. So that's part of this, this theme of civic collaboration. Whoops, going crazy. Is um is kind of the last piece I want to talk about. And this is this not only are we in uh, a building owned by the city, but they're a close working partner of ours, and I think it's, it's a th individuals, it, it, it always takes about leadership, and it always takes somebody, you know, um, in public office, in, if we're talking about public art, that has to have the vision, has to, the will to want to do this, and it's that person or people or group that can then be kind of the insider that a community-based organization like ours, a school district, a citizen group, etc. Um, can work with and through to get it done. Um, and so that's, for us, this idea of creative placemaking and their civic innovation initiatives came together and really became con most concrete in this initiative that, this, that the city launched called Together We Can. And it was, it was in response to these, big fa these terrible factors uh, in National City, which is um, a, a medium-sized post-industrial city, um, but the... The, the degradation, particularly in terms of the environment, not to mention job opportunities and, and other factors, is, is, is um, palpable and visible in the, um, in the city itself. Not to mention it's got the highest rate of disconnected youth, ages 16 to 24, of any city in the county of San Diego. And then this persistence, the poverty persistence level is just ridiculous, 20%. It's one in five, said it, one in five residents. So drilling down a little bit on Together We Can, there were some particularly innovative initiatives that the city passed around um, signage and facade improvement, around neighborhood beautification, and about the activation of the right-of-way. And so if there are any urban planners, city planners in the mix, this is gonna resonate with you because this is exactly the kind of inside baseball, in, in, in the weeds, policy kind of things that happen inside cities that need to be turned inside out and shared in ways that are bite-sized and accessible. And so a campaign like this, even, even down to, to the design of logos and the language that's used, enable us to work with the city. And what, what these programs do are create incentives for business owners, for communities, for school districts to um, improve their property and then work with, with a further incentive to work with community partners around the beautification. And then with the activation of the right-of-way, this is a direct partnership with the city so that places, you know, the, the sidewalks, um, crosswalks, intersections can be enhanced um, in our case, artistic ways. So this is uh, an example of this. And actually, if anyone's gonna be in San Diego in the next sort of two weeks, we're gonna have, as you saw in that pomegranate spiral, we're gonna have the big community build event day on Saturday, June 30th. And it's at this site, it's called the Big B Market being renamed the Old Town Marketing Cafe. And what you see here, and you know, I wish you could do the, the finger enlarged thing, um, but the left side is the old and the right side is the beginning of the new. 
Um, so this is, and there are at least 40 sites like this we've identified in just the city of National City, and these are sites that you'll see in any city in the country, which is a liquor store selling mainly beer, liquor, cigarettes, and you know, unhealthy snacks, and a you know, fairly neglected lot, um, but these are quite often the lifeblood for many residents in, in communities like National City, uh, not only for their convenience, probably why we call them convenience stores in some, some parts of the country. Um, and so what we're doing is that first piece you see is, is a mural, and that's about a, it's about a 28, 28 by 16 or 28 by 14 foot mural. That was a collaboration between two teaching artists and six high school students. This is the... Uh, We'll say this is the hardscaping of the lot that's, that's happening actually last week. This is a render. So in addition to the mural, we've, now, we've also got uh, two community college students and another of our teaching artists that have done, um, that are building a fruit stand, a shaded seating area, and these, these seating areas as, as well as that fence along the property line. So this is the installation of, of um, making this a blighted space, from a blighted space into a community space um, where you're, there's a, that message board, that seating area, any of access to fresh produce that another partner called Brightside is providing to um, stores like this. Here, here's some shots of the, uh, again, this is last, just the last few days, almost real time. It's not like webcam, but it might as well be. Um, that's, uh, that's a few of the interns building the, the fence there on the left, and that's um, Ruben and another student who I can't make out uh, doing the planning for the mural that they painted. So this is another project, and this again involves the public right of way as well as um, an old theater that has been abandoned, um, and that we're going to be—it's going to be a public-private uh, partnership in collaboration with arts as well to revitalize this space, uh, to make it a make it a community arts center, uh, especially to advance our digital media uh, work. So looking forward to that. So I kick myself because I forgot to include the Paradise Creek Trail, and I'll just end with this, which is. The city, around the civic, the, the, the civic innovation initiatives that the city has kicked off, they have this idea of the Paradise Creek Trail. And this is a trail that goes from a park in the northwestern part of the city down to the waterfront. And it, it basically is a wayfinding process to take residents through the entire city to explore the ecological and environmental aspects of the city, its own history, to get to know, for young people to get to um, uh, learn about these and for there to be opportunities for community art to take place. And so there are 19 points along this trail, um, and that is our big project for the coming years, is to do projects like these, processes like these, to activate and animate that trail in the years ahead. So, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I'll uh, invite all three of the speakers to come join me on the stage in these very comfortable chairs. And... Okay, well, we'll go ahead and uh, get started with a little bit of discussion, and I do apologize that we were running a little late on the start. We had some technology issues, um, but I do recognize that we are uh, the only four people standing between you and the reception, so we will try to wrap it up um, right on time and continue any dialogues um, later. So um, I will just take a little point of personal privilege because I have the microphone right now um, and, and just ask you each um, a quick question because this was, I think, and Olivia, I'll reflect back to our conversations, a lot of the dialogue that we had, and you posed the question, I'm stealing my question, what I was going to start off with, with different roles. And it's very interesting to me because we talk about in the arts and, and cultural field so often how we need to de-silo and, and break down those walls and barriers between us. Um, but we've also done a really good job of um, building identity and agency to say, I am, a, I am a public artist, I am a teaching artist, I'm an arts administrator. So I wonder, kind of just on a personal level for all of you to get us going with the Q&A portion, where did you come from and how do you sort of identify in your job function now and does that have an impact on the work that you do um, for the state 
uh, as, a, as an artist educator or um, running a program for youth? I mean, just tying this to my presentation, if you remember, I showed the picture of Bloom Township High School that had all the beautiful WPA art. Then I showed this sort of 1970 school that had graphics. And so I was an art teacher there, actually. And I was like, we should have murals, too. And so I actually, I forget how many murals we did over a number of years, but I actually became a professional muralist by working with my high school students and then actually happened to connect up to Chicago Public Art Group and got some of the kind of mentoring that allowed me as a high school teacher to start, I think, doing more and more sophisticated work. And it's one reason why I'm so invested in the idea of thinking about those people who are actually teachers in schools as part of the resources of teaching artists. You know, somehow or another, the people who don't make that commitment to be there day to day are somehow privileged over the people who are there and really know the community. So I, that was how I sort of, you know, came into this by saying, we don't want a school that doesn't have public art. We'll make it ourselves. I'll, I'll go next. Um, so as I said at the beginning of my um, part, uh, that I am a public art manager. And so I come from the visual arts field, and I was an art gallery director for several years before I started with public art. But beyond that, I've got small kids who are now older. I've got uh, high school, college, and, and middle school age kids. And, um, and beyond that, I just, just think generally in the, in the field of public art, there's a lot more social engagement. That's not our program, though, but I'm certainly aware of it. My colleagues are doing it all the time. Um, and I'm seeing a real way for us to get engaged in a different level. So um, one of the things I didn't talk about, because it's really not about um, arts curriculum uh, per se, but I've got a couple of projects I'm doing right now where, with artists whose practice is social practice. And so, but because our program is really reliant on these permanent objects at the end of it, um, how, do I, how do I combine those forces? So um, Horatio Law, who's a Portland-based artist who does just wonderful social practice work, is working with, um, I think it's grades three to six, the STEM school in Pasco, Washington, which is a fairly, fairly rural uh, community in eastern Washington. and. Uh, and he, as a Chinese immigrant, that's, he's, he often deals with those issues in his work. And these are children who are mostly from agricultural community. They are first generation uh, for the most part. And when they looked at his portfolio from our roster, um, they saw him, those issues that he talked about with, with um, being an immigrant. And, and they thought, this guy gets us somehow. And so he's been working the entire school year. Normally, our process is very typical. Again, it's that old school public art process. Artist comes in, talks to the committee, comes up with an idea, yeah, we like the idea, go ahead and make it, install it, dedicate it, we're done. In this case, he spent a whole year now doing workshops with students, and he started out with a, a folding origami um, butterflies. And, and because this is a STEM school, and within that school, um, they're, they're combining, obviously, their core subjects um, and, and science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and they're talking about, they can use butterflies in biology and other aspects of teaching throughout the school. Um, but he's using it as a launching pad also to talk about immigration and how monarch butterflies come from Mexico and cycle up through North America and, or through the U.S. And, and back down again. And, and generations, it's three generations apparently from beginning to end. And, and I don't want to go too far off topic, but what's really fascinating to me is that he's, he's really building this connection to them that I've never seen in a project I've done before. And, and we don't know where it's going to go. So that's, for me, it's, it's loosening up sort of those restrictions that we felt very careful about in our program and allowing us to, to really look outward and, and to think about what our colleagues are doing and how we can engage with that. Because I think in many ways that may be the most lasting part of this project. I don't know what he's going to do yet. But certainly those of us that have public art programs, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about the legacy of what we're creating and what that thing's going to be like in 40, 50 years and, and did it need to be permanent in the first place. And this will have a permanent sculpture or something at the end. But again, it's, it's that engagement part. So I'm just getting really excited about um, different ways to, to engage our, process, our practice. Well, I come from a really unorthodox background. I don't come, I'm not an artist. I don't come from a public arts background. I was for many, many years a journalist uh, internationally, and, but from San Diego originally and moved back four years ago. And the thing that drew me back was in large part to start and raise a family and two, to think about the future of learning because I, would, I attributed my own way in the world to public schools and the education I got and the centrality of teachers in my life. 
And so that really led me to thinking about youth development and the future of learning both in school and out of school. And immediately previous to taking this role, I was working a lot on um, how we think about credential and learn from all the informal learning opportunities that are out there in museums and libraries and youth-serving organizations. And this opportunity to lead this organization was for me perfect because I'd been working basically at systems and policy level and organizations, and this was an opportunity to work on the ground in my hometown uh, to work directly with youth and to connect with the journalism piece in my own background, the storytelling component that is part of, built into the community curriculum that is an, or, and should be the experience of young people living, growing up in communities. My friend Nate Howard, who runs an organization called Movement B, says, if you're not telling your own story, someone else is telling it for you. And so an organization like us, do you want me to say that again? No takers? <laughs> if you're not telling your own story, someone else is telling it for you. And I think that resonates deeply with our work, and I think through the creative process, and particularly public manifestations of art, that's right on. Awesome. Thank you, and I, I really do just so appreciate um, some of the big themes that are emerging from all three of those answers about you know, those, those intersections or the intertwining, Olivia, to borrow the language from the paper, of you know, the arts and education, but also youth development and social justice and um, uh, you know, all of those elements that are just vital to whatever we do, whether it is in education or whether it is in public art. Um, you know, but I know the other question um, that I'll ask before we kind of turn it over to the audience, but is just around um, the, the other kind of thing that was illuminated from years of this work um, at Americans for the Arts is the, the difference kind of between, um, or the, the struggle, I would say, between um, permanence and process. Uh, so you were talking about how you have to change some of the, the policies. Um, you know, there were obviously what you were talking about welding in National City things, uh, you know, bike racks, um, which is pretty permanent in my opinion. Um, you know, and Olivia, but you were talking about creating stuff in um, schools where kids cycle out after three years and that sense of ownership and identity in a place, but if they're not there anymore and there's a new batch of kids there that may not look the same or, or interact the same way as others. So I just wonder about where is that balance and how do you approach that dichotomy um, between permanence and process of learning? I mean, I've, I've always really believed that it's important to have very high quality public art e with, even with youth collaboration. So um, part of the permanence is you don't get rid of something that's great because the people who made it aren't there anymore. You know, but there are things that maybe fade away. But I, I do think that um, I know that I think almost all the public art that I've done in schools over the years is still there, because one of the things that it does is it becomes part of the school culture. I mean, people remember these stories, and that's why it's so. Actually, a, a, a mural I didn't show today uh, called the Marvelous Surrealist Cafe, and we turned the cafeteria into a marvelous surrealist cafe. We spent, I spent a year doing curriculum with teachers, and one of the things that we looked at is sort of the overlap between high academic achievement and various indicators of creativity. So we began with doing teacher workshops. So the teachers were invested in this idea of surrealist play, and what does it mean to be creative. Some of their work was posted. The kids were pretty interested that all the teachers, not the art teachers, but all the teachers were doing like art and putting it up in the hallways. And gradually, a lot of people, you know, all, everyone got involved. So I think, and that, but then I, th I do think that there's a really important role for me when you're doing, using permanent material of the artist really then exercising a kind of control in actually bringing the best out of the students. So if I'm in a high school where I know the students don't have painting classes, I'm not gonna do a mural based on portraits where I know the students don't have that skill level. But one of the things that you do is like your tools in some ways are your young artists, right? What do they do well I and mean, then how do you make use of that? And I do think that one thing that's important, um, actually I was just talking about this with uh, my, my partner about um, developing some language around requests for proposals and requests for qualifications about what does it mean to be an artist who actually does in-depth research and collaborative design processes with community members. So that then when you're not just having, having this artist say, oh yeah, I'm gonna kind of work with people and then do it. You know, it's like, it's like where, 
are those people, and I think they are people, and there's more and more people who then make that bridge between social engagement, which after all, social engagement art comes from the community mural movement. You know, it's not the other way around, right? So there's a rich history of where that comes from. So I think that, that I would kind of look at it in this way of, again, I think curriculum is a really helpful way to look at it. What do you want to draw attention to? And what do you want to build? Because one of the best things about doing a public art project with a great engaged curriculum in the school community is that you come back a few years later, you'll be standing around and you'll have a student go, oh yeah, well they did that because blah, blah, blah. And you're like, I don't know who this kid is. I never saw him. But the point is that he heard that story from someone else and he's sharing it. So the oral history is always part of a public art piece. Yeah, I just, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to come at the, this process permanent question from a little perspective, different perspective, but it definitely jives with me, that last point about oral history, which is one of the um, sort of personal goals and then it, and by extension organizational goals that we've got is um, how can through everything we do as an organization um, help build a community that the kids growing up there today stay in, come back to, and uh, becomes a generative process in terms of intergenerational living success. And so the stories we, that are, we're writing today in the work we do, do get passed down. And Jeff, I need your an assist here. The, that framework you provided us in the myth and what was the fourth stage? Uh, myth and metaphor. Myth and metaphor. This is important. I'm not going to... But I think this idea of, of the myth is really important. Um, that is both myth breaking, myth busting, and the creation of new myths. And that's what young people can do. And it's actualized in the artistic process. Um, the reputation of a city like National City, what it has been in, in residents' own eyes, not to mention outsiders who don't go there, wouldn't go there. We're, it's, it is a, such a transformative moment right now for public art in National City in order for there to be a future and especially for there to be a future for young kids going, growing up there, because for the most part, kids who grew up there, they had a way out, it's one way. They're, they're not coming back. And so that permanence, I think distilled in the public art is so important that there's gonna be a future for that city that those young people can call their own. And that's that, sh that's that shared ownership piece that comes through that pomegranate method and probably a lot of collaborative community design processes. Yeah, and our program really does have that dichotomy. I mean, it, it doesn't have dichotomy. It, it will soon when we're doing more arts education, but because our projects are permanent, we run into all sorts of things about prevailing wages and, and um, labor laws, and, and it's really hard to get students to, to actually have a hand in this work. And so there are times that that happens. We've certainly worked with technical skills centers where they've welded a part that may not have a structural weld to it and, um, and added that or given it to the artist and the artist is incorporated into the work. And so there's some ways to do that. Certainly some artists are better than others in using imagery that students have provided. But um, really for us, the, the best way to engage other than um, to create and enhance their school, which we're trying to do and I think we're doing fairly successfully, is to bring this curriculum in to build that, that school-wide engagement and, and hope that, that beyond just the, the dedication for the artists that there's more opportunity for them to really understand what's happened, what's coming to their school and, and, and that can be a legacy. Um, hopefully those lesson plans or whatever's been developed will continue throughout. Yeah, that, that's awesome and I, I think both the the oral history legacy, these themes that are emerging, I I'll just I can recognize it in myself. My I, my youngest sister graduated um, last week, and in, in the high school, I found the clay pieces of the mural that I made at some point, um, and dragged some people over and said, "Look, that, that was me. That was me." Um, so, uh, and then I flew here to talk about arts education for days. Um, so we're uh, it's. That's so very true. Um, I do want to open it up to, uh, in our last 10 minutes or so, to questions from the audience. I would ask, though, in keeping with our commitment to accessibility, that you make your way to this microphone here. Um, but are there any questions from folks in the audience? Yeah, and please, and feel free to congregate. Um, it's a long journey. This is a big room. So my question is that from the curriculum side, supporting public art, we've had arts integration efforts or initiatives in my hometown area, where it's been the traditional idea or concept of arts integration, reading language and arts, math, or STEAM. 
integrated with, in this particular case, I'm talking about visual arts. When I look at what's happening in the country and um, the challenges we have as an arts educator, the framework of the social justice standards is um, very critical to this dialogue about inclusion, about diversity, and I was wondering if there were any projects where you've had artists and curriculum writers and teachers who are using those social justice standards. Um, you know, my thing is I always think it's great to really look carefully for your artist and trust your artist. And so a lot of times, you know, I'll um, be asked to, you know, at school, they'll say, oh, we really like, we like literature, so would you do a mural about the literature we read in the school? And you're kind of like, hmm, okay, you know, or, uh, uh, I, and you know, what you have to do, I think, is really be willing to be open to the, to present in this very deep way what you're caring about, but then to be open to kind of surprising solutions. Actually, I did a mural a few years ago, uh, which, which had like input from the children in this community center, but it was the high school students who painted it, and it was called Fellows and Others. And so I live in Chicago, which has a rich tradition of of uh, you know interracial murals, you know, but I was you know one of the things that we did actually in a, in a different project were related was we asked the question: Does making pictures of people of different races who are happy together make it true? And that was a really interesting conversation. And then part of the work that the students did for this indoor piece was to create a questionnaire about issues about race. So these were kids who were black, white, Puerto Rican, and Mexican American, and they went and interviewed people in the community. Yeah, the people had to be adults, at least 21. And so that was fascinating to have that then become part of it. Or another mural I did called Fellows and Others, where the mural was about how you decide who's a fellow and who's an other. And it was kind of edgy, because we did this stuff where we talked about stereotypes. Those people have messy houses. Those people, have, those people drive badly. They eat stinky food. You know, we kind of did this whole work and, and of, around looking at racial stereotypes. And so there's no race represented in particular. It's more about the creation of this othering in American society. So I think that we have to be willing to um, you know, pursue some pretty provocative things. And sometimes I think, especially inside a school, it's easier if it's sort of semi-permanent. It's not like a social practice project that goes away quickly. But if people know, like if it's banners that are hung up on the wall as opposed to painted on the wall, I found that people are much more willing to have something be transgressive and edgy. You know, you know what I'm saying? And those things might end up being there forever because people are interested. But you basically have to be willing to to let those investigations come out, those edgy investigations, those edgy questions, which for me always get to the point that we're not representing something we already believe, we're investigating something we know we need to know more about. And, and I'll just actually just chime in there because we got that a lot when starting to roll this out, the very similar question. So we're actually um, working with an author right now, it's the, not the most official thing, but uh, to explore the kind of radicalization of these practices that we've been discussing here, um, particularly around issues of social justice and racial equity. So um, that's coming. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, well, I was going to say it's hard for our projects, and as I said, because they're intended to be permanent, um, and their people are really nervous about what this thing is going to be and how other people coming into their school are going to see it. And so politics rarely enter into it, certainly not with K-12 schools. And so I think the best way we can do it, we, we certainly push our committees to mm -hmm. look beyond the, the, the books and, and, and the curriculum necessarily that it is fairly stereotypical of what a lot of think that they want. So as a project manager, I try to inspire them to think beyond that. And again, when we engage artists, um, most of them are, are not gonna pander or they may end up pandering and I try to push them a little bit. Um, but I think that the that it's going to be the evolution of, of my program in other ways. So it's going to be including these notions of social justice that happened earlier on, maybe during con convenings, but not maybe not in that permanent thing. Um, it's going to include educators. So this thing that we're talking about, bringing educators in, because we know those are going to be smaller things. They're going to be more um, performative or or something that's going to have a short uh, term and and but may have more resonance. Can I say one other thing about this? I actually have to say that I think that in some ways, um, whether it's public art programs or other kind of public culture that we're comedian in this country, 
is failing creating a citizenry that believes in each other. And so I think that this issue, I tend to not use the language social justice, even though I totally believe in it, because I think it right away has a bunch of people saying that's not about me. You know, so I try to figure out how can we ask that question that gets to the heart of some of those questions without conveying to people that we've already decided. So that Valmeyer project, I think, the one you know I showed you, I think is really interesting because one of the parts of that project is um, it's a German area in southern Illinois, and we looked at a time when German people were targeted because they were seen as others because they were speaking German during World War I and World War II, and they were actually had the Klan visiting them and forcing them to buy savings bonds and stuff. So that was a really interesting moment, and that's part of the, the mural, right? But it's about that community's history, but it also it makes that community start to identify with issues that are happening in America. I do think we need more of that kind of work and we need to like, ask the question or the investigation as neutrally as possible and then just be open to what the answers are, which can be pretty intense and deep. And it doesn't have to be the whole thing, it's a part of the mural, a part of the thing. Because if we don't do that, we're not actually using art to try to you know, ask different kinds of questions. If people don't feel they're represented in certain kinds of public art, they might cling to their Confederate monuments, you know? So what other kind of art could there be that people can identify with that allows them to become a different subject in a sense? And I think I, I do have to apologize, it is six, so we do need to wrap up for those who weren't able to ask their questions. I'm sure everyone on the panel will be generous to hang around for a few minutes, um, but I'm cognizant of the time um, for those viewing uh, digitally and um, here in person. Um, so I just wanna say thank you, and I do think that it is a very um, appropriate uh, notion to land on the intersections with um, social uh, issues uh, as we start to look forward towards the rest of our, um, our work in this intersection of public art and arts education. Um, so thank you all for being with us here today. I will say that we um, are building out this toolkit, so there will be several notices going out um, in the next, actually like the next two weeks, um, for folks to uh, engage in some of our work. So please keep an eye out um, for those as we start to move forward to identify tools and resources to advance the field. Um, that's my shameless plug. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you again. Can we hear it one more time for our fantastic speakers? And please do enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you.